I moved to Texas six years ago to take my job here at Austin College. And being an astronomer, I was the butt of several jokes moving to the Lone Star State. <laughs> but I think my brother-in-law said it best when he said, poor David, with only that one Lone Star to study now, Here is that lone star, the main subject of my talk tonight, today, and what you probably know better as the sun. But what you may be wondering is why I call the sun lone. What makes our sun so lonely? But perhaps more vitally, who cares? So to answer the first question, the reason our sun is so lonely is because space is so big, and I'm going to be describing that. That's the point of my talk tonight. But let me address the second question now. Who cares? The people who care are people who have an interest in space. They're the people who love to learn about space missions, missions to Mars, missions to the moon, the Dragon capsule, and who want more. They're the people who create science fiction, and they're the people who devour science fiction. They're the engineers who actually build the space capsules that our astronauts go up in. And they're the young people who hope to one day help with that endeavor. All of these people, the space people, whether dreamers or doers, have one thing in common, a fascination with what lies beyond. And I'm going to give you a look at that beyond. I'm going to give you a cold, hard look at the vastness of space. But to start, I think I want to begin with the popular view of the cosmos. If you look at uh, a video online, YouTube, or you're watching a movie or a television show, probably what you're going to see is something where everything is really close together. You see a perspective with lots of planets nearby one another. And of course, there's always warp speed, right? So it doesn't take very long to get from place to place. But the reality is quite a bit different from these imaginings. To give you one example, the distance between the Earth, where we are, and the Sun, our lone star, is 94 million miles. 94 million miles. You all know how long it takes you to run a mile, right? Imagine running that mile. Okay, now try imagine running for 94 million of them. <laughs> that would take longer than your life. So there's no real way to conceive of that number. You can think of that number, but it really actually doesn't make a great deal of sense. It's just a number. And to give you a second example, the nearest star outside of our solar system is 4.2 light years away. But again, we have a problem because what is a light year? When light in our everyday life is instantaneous, you turn on the lights, the lights are on. Light moves too fast to understand that number, too. So we need some kind of context for understanding how big space is. To put it in the form of a scientific question, we could ask, can we conceptualize the size of space? So that's our question. And this is my best answer to that question. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to shrink the sun down to the size of this basketball. So now you know why it's finally here. <laughs> if the sun were the size of this basketball, then where would the Earth be? And how big is it? That 94 million miles shrinks down to a mere 25 meters, which is outside this theater in the old art gallery beyond. 25 meters away. And on this scale, the size of the Earth is only the size of a nerd candy or the cross-section of a sprinkle on your ice cream. Earth is tiny, it's absolutely tiny, and really far away. Between this sun and Earth, there are, of course, two other little things. Mercury would be about the middle of the first section here, and Venus would be about the middle of the second section back there. And for everything inside of Earth's orbit, that's it. 
That's all there is in the inner solar system. Mars, of course, is a little further on, but the biggest planet in the solar system is Jupiter. On this scale, Jupiter is about the size of a small marble located 120 meters away, which is in the right campus center, two buildings over. Saturn is twice as far away as Jupiter. We're still on campus. Uranus is twice as far away as Saturn, so now we're off campus. And Neptune is three times Saturn's distance. On this scale, uh, Neptune would be a half a mile away. And this red circle represents a radius of one half mile around this position right here. One half mile in every direction, and we have all eight planets. A mile from end to end of that circle, and we have a basketball, a couple of marbles, and some other things too small to otherwise be noticed. Suddenly, social distancing doesn't seem too far away, does it? <laughs> the solar system actually keeps on going. This is not the edge of the solar system. The edge is what's known as the heliopause, which is an ill-defined region way, way out there. On this scale, three kilometers, or almost two miles. And that's this big circle. And between Neptune's orbit, half a mile away, and the heliopause, almost two miles away, there's a smattering of comets the size of dust grains, very slightly larger dwarf planets, and that's it. So that's our solar system in a nutshell. Of course, the real question before us, though, was why is our star lonely? Our lone star. So let's talk about that next nearest star to the sun. It has a name, it's called Proxima Centauri. And Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years away, as I've already said. One thing you might be interested in knowing is if the sun is as big as a basketball, Proxima Centauri is the size of this ping pong ball, because stars come in different sizes too. So, what do you think? 4.2 light years away, how far away is this ping pong ball from this basketball? It has to be outside the solar system, so it has to be more than two miles, right? What do you think, 10 miles? 100 miles? <laughs> I can sense that you know where I'm going with this. 4,300 miles away. If we tried to put this on a map of the Earth, we could choose a few places to put it. For instance, let's go west. It would be in the Pacific Ocean, halfway between the Hawaiian Islands and Midway Atoll, if the basketball were here. Or going south, we'd be in South America, in northern Chile, the city of Antofagasta, which is on the Tropic of Capricorn. Or if we go eastward towards Europe, it would be almost all the way to the west coast of Ireland. And I want it to sink in for you that between this basketball, our sun, with its planets and moons and asteroids and comets out to a distance of two miles, and this next nearest star, Proxima Centauri, there's nothing. Empty, black space, devoid of life, devoid of anything to look at. Think about that the next time you're on a long car ride <laughs> or a flight, because if you left your basketball son at home, you'd be on an interstellar adventure of the most boring kind, because <laughs> unlike your car ride, unlike your flight, there would be nothing to see. You've all heard of the Milky Way galaxy. It's where we live. Along with about 100 billion other stars or so, I've marked about where the sun is, halfway between the center and the outer edge of the Milky Way galaxy. But once again, we've encountered this problem with numbers. I've quoted a number, 100 billion. And again, that is like no number that you have experience with in your everyday life. And so let's even just try to understand it based on the analogy I've already used. If every star is a basketball or a ping pong ball or some other type of ball, and each of them is separated, and this is actually pretty accurate, by a distance similar to us between, between us and Proxima Centauri, 
I can't conceive those kinds of distances. 100 billion stars, 100 billion basketballs, each of them separated from one another by 4,000 miles or more? Space truly is incomprehensibly large. So here we are on this tiny speck of rock called Earth, orbiting a really far distance from our sun. And all the stars that we see at night, they're all further away than Proxima Centauri is. And I have to be brutally honest about this one. We do not have the technology to visit those places. Space people everywhere, that is one of your limits, perhaps the most important limit. And now that we have defined that limit, we can begin to dream how to go past it, how to conquer it. Creators of science fiction, imagine your worlds with this science fact. Forget warp drive. Forget putting things closer together. Deal with space as it really is. There's a compelling human story about crossing that, about making that an endeavor and engineers, present and future. Start planning for how we're going to have the energy to go these long distances, and how we're going to sustain life for those long journeys. Because if we collectively believe that we can, we will. And those first people who go on a ship heading out into the stars, to land on some other planet around some other star, they will have been assisted by an army of scientists and engineers. And they will be buoyed by the hopes and dreams of all of humanity left behind here on Earth. It will be a shared victory, and I call that seeing beyond. Thank you.